Okay. Assalamualaikum and good morning to everyone who is joining us today. Welcome to all school students, teachers, parents from all around Malaysia, not forgetting all UMS students and staff present in this webinar session. Thank you and we meet again for today's sessions of STEM speaker series or 3S. For your information, 3S is a collaboration between U Science UMS and my STEM ambassador UMS. My name is Edda Shawati Binti Dakim. I am from U Science UMS as a science officer will be in charge as moderator for this session. For those who join us for the first time, this STEM speaker series is a co-joint effort with Institute for Tropical Biology and Conservation UMS. This program is fully sp supported by the Sabah Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation, aimed to deliver unique and interesting STEM topics designed by subject matter experts to increase the interest of school students, teachers and community alike to venture in the fields of STEM. For any question from the audience, please feel free to drop your questions on the chat box at the right side of this YouTube live session. Please be informed that for today's session, e-certificate will be given to school students and UMS students. Therefore, I would like everyone to stay tuned with us to fill the form given through true link that will be shared at the end of the session. So before we started, I would like to introduce our speaker. With us today is Dr. Eng Ting Hui, a senior lecturer at the Institute for Tropical Biology and Conservation, UMS. She, she received her BSc and PhD from the National University of Singapore. Her research interests include biodiversity and ecology of freshwater mollusks, invasive species, and natural history collection in Southeast Asia. So without further ado, Please welcome Dr. Eng Ting Hui with her topics entitled Freshwater Snails and Bivalves of Southeast Asia. What, where, can eat? Doctor, please be invited. Thank you very much. Let me just share my screen. Okay, good morning everyone. So, uh, thank you for the introduction. For my talk today, I'll be sharing with you a little bit, um, sort of an introduction about freshwater snails and bivalves, collectively called freshwater mollusks of Southeast Asia. So this is the outline of my talk today. I'll just briefly give an introduction, um, including what are freshwater mollusks and where can they be found. And the last part of my talk, can eat. Uh, so it will be a bit of a, not just about eating, but uh, we'll see uh, what it involves. So firstly, what are freshwater mollusks? These are general characteristics of uh, mollusks, and uh, they include a vast variety of uh, organisms. Some of it look more like worms, uh, some of it look more like a typical uh, mollusk, like a snail. So these are the characteristics. All mollusks would have a ventral foot, a dorsal, visceral mass, uh, a mantle, which secretes calcium carbonate shells. So in some uh, mollusks, you can see the shells, some are uh, internal. And finally, all mollusks have a rasping organ, uh, which uh, in the snails you can see here, it's a radula. So when we talk about freshwater mollusks, it only includes two groups of all the mollusks. These are the gastropods, uh, commonly called the snails and the bivalves. So these would be the clams or the mussels. So these two groups here. So they don't really, they are not uh, directly related to one another, but what they share is their habitat. So all freshwater mollusks are found in um, freshwater habitats. This would include uh, natural habitats like springs or groundwater systems, uh, freshwater swamps, uh, lakes, uh, rivers and streams, um, including uh, waterfalls like this, and also human uh, modified habitats. So this would include uh, paddy fields, uh, fish ponds, and even just uh, the longkang, uh, just outside your house or schools. 
So there's a vast variety of uh, shapes and sizes when it comes to uh, freshwater snails and bivalves, as you can see here. They may not be as uh, colorful, perhaps, as some land snails or marine snails and uh, bivalves, but they do come in different sizes from very tiny ones up to larger ones uh, like these up here. I'll talk a little bit more about these apple snails later. Um, and they are found in different habitats, as I mentioned earlier. So when we compare to the marine and terrestrial snails, uh, freshwater snails are only about 5% of the total known species. Uh, and, and when we look at bivalves, which are only found in aquatic habitats, um, freshwater bivalves are only 10% out of all known uh, species of bivalves. So the rest are in the marine environment. So what makes them so unique that I would like to, uh, that I focus my research on them? So when we look at the reproduction of freshwater snails, um, often they lay eggs. Uh, some of them, uh, instead of laying eggs, uh, which we can see, like the apple snails over here, um, some of them actually brood their eggs internally. So in this uh, group of snails, the tiarids, the snails develop internally in the parent, um, and when they hatch, they are just tiny versions of the adults. Um, in the nerites, this other group, um, these are the egg masses that are sometimes laid on another shell. Um, they may be released as tiny larvae uh, and left to develop out in the environment, or they may be released as uh, tiny uh, versions of the adults. In the bivalve, some groups, uh, they also release uh, larvae. Some de develop internally within the parent, or some are released uh, free-swimming without uh, incubation. And this very interesting, the largest uh, family among the freshwater bivalves, the unionids, um, they actually rely on a fish host. So the, when, the fish, uh, when the female bivalve has to release uh, the tiny larvae, uh, before these can develop into adults, they actually need to live on, um, they become parasites on a fish host. Some are specific to a certain species of fish, um, either in the gills, or in, on the fins, and uh, once they develop to a certain uh, stage, then they are able to release themselves and develop into adults. So there are some uh, species, especially in North America, uh, where they develop this part of their mantle to resemble a uh, tiny fish. So this, the, the photo on the top here shows an actual fish. The photo on the bottom, this is not the fish, this is actually part of the bivalve, but it's been developed to attract a predator of this fish uh, to, to approach the bivalve and so that it can release uh, its young to develop onto this host fish. So in terms of how they eat, there's also a variety uh, of habits. Uh, in the snails, they may be grazers. So this snail here at the bottom is actually grazing on the side of the aquarium. Um, they may scavenge uh, for food. Um, most of them are herbivores, but there are some uh, species like this one here. It's commonly called the assassin snail, which is carnivorous and it uh, feeds on other uh, invertebrates or other snails. They may also feed on uh, suspended material like these snails here. Uh, they're just feeding on the top of the water uh, surface. And in the bivalves, they filter feed. So there are also some snails that filter feed. Um, and among all these functions, besides just providing nutrients to the molars themselves, they may also be providing an ecosystem service in uh, recycling the nutrients in the environment, especially for the bivalves. So besides uh, molars eating other uh, plants or, or other organisms, they are also prey uh, for other creatures, uh, including uh, birds. Um, some insects also feed uh, on, on uh, molas, like this snail here, is being fed on by the larvae of a fly. Um, and there are also leeches that are specific to certain species of snails. Uh, so for example, this is the Lake, lake Inlay in Myanmar. Uh, this particular leech was found uh, only on this uh, particular species of snail that is only found in Lake Inlay and nowhere else in the world. So besides being fed on uh, by other organisms, there are also other um, associations that molas uh, can serve as, uh, I guess, in a sense, an ecosystem service. They may provide shelter for other organisms, like here um, in one of the lakes in Sulawesi, they provide shelter, uh, these empty shells provide shelter for the shrimp. Um, they may also host a variety of parasites. We'll talk a bit about uh, the parasites that 
uh, freshwater molas host and um, also uh, provide symbiosis for other organisms. So we move on to where are they found. So earlier I talked briefly about what kind of habitats where you can find uh, freshwater molas. So the highest, uh, these numbers here show the number of species that's estimated in each of these regions around the world. And the highest diversity, uh, similar to many other taxa, it's found in the tropical regions. So in the Indo-Tropical region where uh, we are found here in Malaysia, it's included in this region. Um, there are more than 300 species of bivalves that uh, are known from this region and possibly more than 600 species of snails uh, that are found here. So when we zoom in into Southeast Asia, uh, we don't know for sure how many species that we have, how many species of freshwater snails, how many species of freshwater bivalves. So some of these uh, numbers here come from references or studies that have been done possibly 100 to 200 years ago uh, when the species were first described. So it's uh, not been easy to get all these numbers, uh, but these are just the estimates of how many species of freshwater mollusks that we can find in this region. And when we look at regions which uh, have high numbers or high numbers of species, high diversity of freshwater molas, so this map shows uh, Asia as a whole. Um, so China here has the highest number of uh, Unionida uh, bivalves, so freshwater mussels, um, and followed by the region below here, Myanmar, Thailand, uh, Vietnam. So the darker colors indicate the, the most uh, higher number of species. So, but when uh, these uh, researchers accounted for the size of the countries, so the number of species according to the size of the countries, when we look at it, the, the most diverse regions are actually here uh, in the Indo-Chinese region. So the highest, because Cambodia is quite a small country, but it holds a high number of uh, bivalve species. It's actually the highest, uh, most diverse uh, for bivalves or the size of its countries, followed by its neighbors here in the Indo-Chinese region. And for Malaysia, we are not too bad also. Uh, for the freshwater snails, the uh, regions in Southeast Asia, which host the highest snail diversity, freshwater snail diversity, uh, include Lake Inle, which I mentioned earlier with this uh, species that's only found there. Uh, this is another species that's only found in Lake India and nowhere else in the world. So endemic means uh, that these 30 species are only found in Lake India and nowhere else in the world. So the lower Mekong River Basin, which covers uh, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, and uh, exits through Vietnam here, um, also holds, uh, holds a high number of species that are only found in this region. Uh, and then we move over here to the Sulawesi Lakes. Uh, there are many ancient lakes here on this island in Indonesia and which also holds a high number of endemic species. So earlier I mentioned that freshwater snails and bivalves are only a small proportion of what we know, uh, the known diversity of uh, snails and bivalves in the world compared to terrestrial and marine ecosystems. However, when we looked at the proportion, the number of species that are threatened uh, so endangered species or species threatened with extinction, um, a higher proportion, the highest proportion of species um, that are threatened are found in freshwater systems. So this is because uh, they are limited to particular habitats like freshwater, not, not like marine systems which uh, have a wider habitat range. And um, also they may have a long uh, development time compared to other uh, snails and bivalves. So what are the threats that are faced by freshwater molas? Uh, they are similar to the threats that are faced by other freshwater organisms like fish or crustaceans um, all over the world. So these are the main uh, threats that have been identified and they do not uh, function uh, individually. So often when there is a place that has uh, undergone uh, modification of the river, for example, where dams are built, uh, the habitat is also degraded um, and then it might experience also water pollution. And uh, at the same time, you may have species invading into the system and all these different threats may interact uh, to contribute to uh, the threatened status of freshwater molas. And when we look at Southeast Asia specifically, um, these are the three main threats that have been identified. So flow modification, especially in the large river systems, uh, water pollution, 
Um, and finally, overexploitation. I'll talk a bit more about this uh, later on. So it's related to the harvesting of species for food and the ornamental trade. So we have not had uh, that many studies assessing uh, the conservation status of freshwater mollusks in Malaysia itself. So this was this is one of the only studies that we have, uh, which only assessed one group of the freshwater bivalves, the mussels, um, and it found that there are 17 species that are uh, of concern. Um, so there's one species that's critically endangered here, uh, one endangered, um, and the rest are vulnerable and near threatened. And a number of species are data deficient. So we don't even know uh, enough to assess whether uh, they need some help or not. Okay, so I'll move on to the next session. Um, so this question, can eat? So it's very common here in Malaysia and actually the rest of Asia when we talk, when I talk about uh, my research. So people will ask, boleh makan? Uh, so the answer to that for fresh when it comes to freshwater molas is uh, yes, uh, maybe, because, but um, yeah, we'll see about the but part later. Um, so these are some pictures of uh, freshwater molas that are eaten all over Southeast Asia. So you wouldn't just find them being sold in markets like this. Uh, this one is uh, at uh, Tamo Dongongan here in Sabah. Um, it might also be sold in uh, seafood restaurants, for example, here in Singapore um, and served at buffets in hotels, for example, in Vietnam and Cambodia. Um, so different styles of cooking, but all these are fresh autumn mola. So usually they are served in inland regions, uh, which are far from the sea and they're not able to get seafood. And these are some of the groups of commonly eaten fresh autumn mo uh, molas in Southeast Asia. So the, this is one family. These are the largest um, freshwater snails um, in the, some of the la largest freshwater snails in the world. Um, the family Ampularidae, con commonly called apple snails. So locally here uh, in Sabah, I've been told that they are called Gulupu or Tungo, depending on which region you're from. Um, and then Siput Gondang, it's a common name uh, used throughout, uh, even in Peninsula and Indonesia. But it may refer to uh, a species that's not native to this region. I'll talk a, a little bit more about it later. And I think very common here in Sabah is the Tunto. These are the uh, snails from the family Pachycilidae. They're found in the rivers. Um, in the paddy fields, you have the family Viviparidae. So this, uh, this family is found throughout Southeast Asia and commonly eaten also in Thailand. Um, Sirenidae, these are bivalves, small freshwater bivalves uh, eaten throughout the region. Uh, there are some also culturing, aquaculture of these species. And finally, from the family Unionidae, these are also commonly called Lokan here. So these are not the ones that are found uh, in the mangroves or in the marine environments, but these are all freshwater uh, molas. So we come to the why, why my answer is not a straightforward yes when people ask whether they can be eaten or not. So these are three points that uh, I'll just share a little bit more for today. Um, so first, uh, some species of freshwater molas are actually intermediate hosts of parasites that can affect uh, humans. Uh, secondly, there are some species that are not native um, and can cause problems. They can become pests and invasive species. And thirdly, there is also a problem of over-harvesting of some of these species in some parts of Southeast Asia. So firstly, some freshwater snails, uh, they host zoonotic parasites. So zoonotic parasites are parasites that infect animals and somehow can be transmitted to humans and cause diseases in humans, sometimes quite serious diseases. So for example, there's a group of uh, flatworms uh, that can cause the disease schistosomiasis in humans. Um, and before, in, during the developmental process, they require an intermediate host, which are snails. Um, and after and subsequently, they are able to penetrate the skin of hum the final host, which are humans, and cause all kinds of problems. So um, even up to now, in, in, there's this paper in Kelantan that showed that um, schistosomiasis is an issue in, um, this is not the serious one, it's a carrier dermatitis, but it's caused by a similar uh, flatworm from the same uh, genus, schistosoma uh, genus in Kelantan that causes problems uh, to farmers working in paddy fields. 
And this is another disease, angiostrongyolysis, that's uh, caused by roundworms. So it's uh, the, one of the intermediate hosts of some of these species are the apple snails, which I mentioned earlier, uh, back in the 70s, uh, 80s, uh, and 60s to the 80s, sort of. There were, there were a lot of studies being conducted in peninsular Malaysia and also uh, here in Sabah, uh, looking at what are the potential intermediate hosts of this uh, parasite. Um, so here, in, when this study was conducted uh, in Toran in Sabah, they actually found that this uh, species of snail, this apple snail, is a host uh, for this parasite. So it's a concern when uh, people are eating these uh, snails. Okay, so next I will move on to the issue of uh, introduced species. Okay, so before I proceed, I'll just like to... Uh, to give a brief overview of the terms that I'll be using. So for a species that's uh, found in a native environment, we call it a native species, so it's naturally occurring uh, in a particular uh, area. So however, when humans carry this species out of its native range, for example, on, um, on purpose because they want to breed this species in a new uh, area, or uh, it accidental introduction like it comes uh, with ornamental plants uh, it's accidentally carried in our luggage in our shoes in our clothing when we go hiking outside and we don't clean um, or some they hitch a hike uh, on the train or a bus uh, going to a new area for example um, so when this happens uh, and a species is brought into a new area that's not it that it does not uh, occur naturally um, in the, the introduced range it, we would call them, we would call them uh, introduced, uh, non-native or non-indigenous species. So there are various terms, but all these refer to a species that's brought out of its native range and uh, usually by human means. So when this species is brought into its introduced range and it starts to multiply, it's, uh, it starts to spread. So for example, in this picture here, it shows uh, the map of Thailand, a species that was brought in initially, uh, concentrated here in uh, the area of Bangkok. By uh, less than 10 years later, it's found all throughout the country, where in places that it's not found. So it spreads. And besides that, it also starts to have a negative impact on the natural environment, or it has a negative impact on a native species that's found uh, in its introduced range. So when a species is, it arrives in an introduced range, it's able to survive and it's able to thrive in the sense of uh, causing a negative impact, then and only then should we call this an invasive species. Okay, so often there are many species that are introduced to uh, an area, but it does not uh, spread or does not cause a negative uh, impact on the environment or uh, or native species, then, we, then it remains at this stage. Uh, only when it causes, uh, it fulfills all these criteria do we call it an invasive species, okay? So which is why I'm only using the term introduced uh, for this section. So there are many ways in which uh, freshwater molars have been uh, brought out of their natural ranges. Uh, this would include intentional means where people bring in for the ornamental pet trade or for aquaculture for food as I mentioned, uh, or accidentally, where they hitchhike on uh, ornamental plants that we use to decorate our aquariums or our fish ponds, or with other animals, for example, fish. So in the past, fish was brought into uh, peninsular Malaysia to be uh, from, from other regions to be introduced as food in these barrels of water from its original range. And oftentimes, uh, the other animals that are found in the water may also be brought along, including freshwater snails. Okay, what are the potential impacts uh, of this introduced species? Uh, some of them may cause, uh, directly or indirectly, cause the decline of native species, um, or they may cause some form of uh, eco change to the natural ecosystem or destroy the natural ecosystem in its introduced range. Um, and there may be some economic costs. For example, if they destroy a paddy field, then there's an economic cost to us. Uh, or if they grow in high numbers and clog up our water pipes uh, and you need money to replace or to clean up the pipes, all these are uh, economic costs of introduced species. So I'd like to just give you an example of some one of the 
most widely introduced snails, uh, not just in Southeast Asia, but also in the world, are the um, apple snails. So apple snails, I mentioned earlier, are the largest among all freshwater snails. Um, there is one genus, the genus Pila, that is native here to Southeast Asia. Um, but there's also the genus Pomacia, which has been introduced to Southeast Asia. So this shell, this snail that you see here. So two species of Pomacia have been introduced into Southeast Asia. Uh, they are commonly called golden apple snails. They are native to South America. And they were brought into Asia in the 1980s uh, for food. Uh, but unfortunately, instead, uh, they have caused um, great extensive damage to paddy fields throughout the region. Um, there was a study in 2013 that estimated that it cost up more than uh, almost 1.5 billion US dollars a year, uh, the damage that's caused by these uh, invasive snails. So these ones, I would refer to them as invasive because they have uh, cause, been recorded to cause damage. Um, they are suspected to be displacing native species, but it's also possible that it's because of uh, habitat loss that, that um, is um, resulting in the disappearance of some of the native species. And when the habitat changes, uh, these uh, introduced species are the first ones to come in because they, they have a more they are more adaptable uh, to, to less than ideal conditions. And um, how would, would you know if these species are found in your nearby paddy fields or waterways? They, you would always see their pink color eggs here. Um, so just check in, in, uh, if you have a, a longkang outside your house or your school, you can peep in and see if you can see these clusters of pink eggs. And that's a sign that these snails are present. So they are all over Malaysia. Um, and all over the region. So when we, um, myself and my colleagues, we conducted a study in Thailand a few years ago, uh, when we looked at records in the museum uh, for uh, the native apple snails, uh, even up to the 1990s, there were records of them all over the country. Uh, but when we went out to do a survey um, in 2017 to 2018, we didn't find as many of them. Um, and some of these points were actually only individual shells, uh, not healthy populations of snails. Um, instead, everywhere we went, uh, we saw pink eggs. And uh, this, this was what we found instead. So most of the, the habitats uh, throughout where we, we surveyed in Thailand, we found these uh, snails, the invasive ones. And the same situation also in peninsular uh, Malaysia and Singapore. This is an older study that I've done. Uh, when we looked at older records uh, in, in papers and in the museums, the snail used to be distributed. If you look at the gray out areas or, um, and the black, the black uh, diamonds showed native apple snails that were found in 2014, but um, only found in a few habitats. But everywhere else, you see the red color. Everywhere else, uh, when we surveyed, we saw the pink eggs. So they have caused such uh, extensive damage uh, to paddy field systems, especially uh, that there were a lot of studies conducted uh, throughout the region to try to control them. So these were two uh, and some some examples of two studies that were done here in Sabah, uh, where they tried to uh, tried to test different systems of planting the rice um, and also uh, using ducks to control uh, this invasive snail. So I think to some extent, all these efforts have paid off because uh, the species is not as, um, has not done as much damage here uh, in recent years, from what I understand. And finally, also, uh, one concern when we talk about eating these snails is the threat of over-harvesting. So in Cambodia, the Tonle Sap Lake, which is uh, the largest freshwater lake here in this region, um, there are a few species of uh, freshwater mollusks that are harvested for food. Um, so the apple snails, the viviparids, the, the ones that are commonly found in paddy fields. Uh, but there's a different species that's found in the lake here. Um, and the freshwater plants. So they are harvested uh, mainly also by small holders like this family here. So the small, uh, in smaller amounts but there are also probably some commercial harvesters where they 
if you look at all these bags here, they are filled. These ones are filled with clams. These ones are filled with snails. This, uh, this lorry here is filled to the brim with freshwater clams. So a study that uh, was done by my colleague uh, shown here, Dr. Ngo in uh, Cambodia, they found that a, a single landing site, uh, they, they harvested more than 8,000 tons of freshwater molas in a year. So that's really a lot of freshwater molas. And when they analyzed uh, the sizes of the snails, uh, they found a significant reduction in growth rate. So uh, indicating that probably this uh, harvesting pressure is having some negative impact on the populations in the lake. Um, besides food, also there are some uh, species of freshwater mollusks, both the snails and the bivalves, which are sold in honor for as pets in the ornamental pet trade. So we did a survey of the Singapore ornamental pet trade from 2008 to 2014. And we found almost 60 species of uh, mollusks that are sold in the trade, or they were occurring as hitchhikers on aquatic plants. And among these, there are eight species here that I've highlighted in these boxes that are only found in particular river systems, for example, in the um, Mekong River. Uh, um, no, there's a river system in Thailand, and also some of the lakes uh, in Sulawesi. So these um, are species that are only found in these uh, river systems or in the lakes and nowhere else. So this, um, the impact of them being harvested for the ornamental pet trade, we, are, we, we still do not know, uh, but there is possibly uh, the threat of over-harvesting if these species get too popular. So let's come to the closing part of my talk. Um, so as you've seen, that freshwater molars in Southeast Asia are quite diverse, but they are threatened. Um, they can be eaten, but uh, we need to be aware that some may host zoonotic parasites, uh, some that if we bring in in too large numbers or we try to breed them um, and we are not careful, they may become invasive species which would cause harm uh, to the environment or to our pockets. Um, and uh, if there's we are not careful also that maybe some species that may become uh, may be over harvested and this would have impacts uh, on the survival of the species. So there's still a lot of things that we do not know about freshwater molas in Southeast Asia. So a lot more research needs to be done. We need to look into their ecology and their biology, their population the dynamics, basically just seeing uh, to find out more about the places that they live in. Uh, their interactions with other uh, animals, with their environment, uh, what they eat, uh, when do they breed. So there's a lot of this information that uh, we still do not know. Um, and to study the impacts of invasive species or introduced species. So these are some of um, the, the areas that need further research here in Southeast Asia. And finally, we also need uh, better documentation. So before we can uh, say for sure whether a species is introduced or not, uh, we need to know what we actually have uh, that's naturally, naturally occurring that's native to this area. But uh, oftentimes we don't even know, we don't even have that information. Uh, so or we, we may have some papers, some studies from decades or centuries ago, uh, but we do not have the specimens to compare uh, them to current to the snails that we can find here today. So if we are not able to identify the species properly uh, based on previous records, then we can't really proceed uh, for further research, for further conservation of what we have now. Um, and in this sense, um, this is why we need uh, proper uh, natural history collections uh, to store these specimens. So in um, my institute here at UMS, uh, we have the Bonensis collections um, where we have specimens, uh, plants and animals specimens, which are used for research. So it's really important uh, to maintain these collections uh, all throughout Malaysia, not just here in Sabah. Um, if you would like to know more about natural history collections, I would encourage you to listen to my to a talk by my colleague, uh, Associate Professor Evan Kua. He gave it, I think, uh, some months ago, and it's available on this uh, 3S speaker series. Okay, so that's all I have for today. Thank you very much. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, ask.
you very much, Dr. Eng Ting Hui. It was a very interesting and wonderful topic and very well presented. presented. We invite for some questions to be answered by our speaker that were sent to us during the presentation. So the first question is, uh, Doctor, is there any significant symptoms from the potential zoonotic diseases caused by the molars? Yeah, I'm, I'm not. A, first, I'll say that I'm not a medical doctor, so I won't be able to answer that question uh, too much in detail. But I understand that some of these diseases can be quite serious. It could be as serious as um, liver cancer or brain damage. Um, some of it, uh, depending on the species of the parasite, it's, it's milder in the sense that you just get rashes on your skin. So it really depends uh, on, on the parasite. Yeah, but it can be quite serious. Okay, thank you, Doctor, for the answer. So is there any question from the, the audience? Okay. I guess I would also add that, um, so for people who want to eat this freshwater molas, it's uh, important for you to cook it well. So sometimes we prefer to have uh, food like sashimi, like raw, then you get a different taste, right? Um, but because of freshwater molars potentially may uh, harbor this parasite, so it's, you need to be careful uh, when we eat them. Thank you, doctor, for the answer. Is there any more question? Okay. If you don't have my, any more questions, we would like to end this session for today. So thank you, doctor, for answering the audience questions. We hope the audience enjoyed this amazing and interesting presentation by our wonderful speaker. The link for registration and e-certificate is now being shared for school students and UMS students. Please fill in your details and answer the simple feedback questionnaire. All students will receive e-certificate, while SDP point will be given to UMS students only. Thank you again to Dr. Eng Ting Hui for the, for the time to share with us. And thank you also to all the audience for your participation. We look forward to seeing you in the next 3S. Do not forget to follow us on Facebook and Instagram to keep you updated on the next session. It was a pleasure to have all of you with us on this beautiful day. With this, we conclude our webinar. Thank you for the cooperation and see you again. Okay. okay, doctor, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. All right.